Our next speaker probably doesn't need any introduction either, but luckily his list of affiliations is slightly smaller than, than Jeff's. Uh, Torsten Wagner is Professor of Water and Environmental Engineering at the University of Bristol in uh, the UK, Director of the Water and Environmental Management Research Centre at the same university and Chair of the University of Bristol Water Team at the, uh, the Cabot Institute. Um, he has a PhD from Imperial College London, if you didn't know that. Um, and his list of uh, awards is also far too long to, um, uh, to go through, but let me just mention that he recently gave the Paul Witherspoon lecture at the AGU meeting last fall in December. Torsten, up to you. Thank you very much, Walter. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to, to be here. It's like going back in time you know, with colleagues and friends and, and mentors from Imperial College is, a, is really great. Um, I changed the title of my talk a little bit because initially I wanted to talk more about some recent work, but I thought let's, in, in the context of the questions we were, we were asked and with respect to having a, um, something we might want to put together later, I thought I'll just give some thoughts on large-scale hydrologic modeling. And <clears throat> I'm one of these people Jeff mentioned shouldn't exist because I'm, I'm not really a field person and I don't have that many <laughs> days in the field, I'm afraid. So. But nonetheless, nonetheless, I think, I think this, this fits very well. I think it connects very well to what you were saying. So I started my PhD with Howard about almost exactly 20 years ago, uh, minus four months or something. And um, I had, to, I had to choose between the University of Florida, who was also offering me an opportunity, and Imperial College. And as a, as a German student at the time, quite ignorant to things like university rankings and citation records and these things. So, so the only thing I had to, to, to go by was the, the project and the excitement that the project was that I was offered in the different, different places. So for the sake of science, it was goodbye sunshine and beaches, and hello, <laughs> fog and warm beer. Um, the, the project I was, I was working on at the time was uh, uh, a NERC project, Natural Environment Research Council project that Howard had gotten on prediction in ungauge basins. And it had uh, some predefined objectives, what was meant to be achieved. Um, so it was meant to develop uh, minimally parameterized hydrologic models. Um, to maximize identifiability. It was to develop an uncertainty framework for gauged and ungauged situations, and it was to, to package all of that also preferably in a, in a software that can be passed on, passed on to other people. Now, I'm at the moment, I'm at the University of Potsdam on a, on a sabbatical leave just outside Berlin, and as you do in a sabbatical time, it's a good opportunity to think, okay, what am I gonna do over the next five years? What are my objectives? Um, what are the opportunities? And when I wrote them down, I realized I had the same problem that Jeff was mentioning, namely that I hadn't really moved on, uh, but I was still struggling with the, with the same problems. And I think not because, it's, one reason is because there weren't sort of fashionable problems at the time, there were fundamental problems that we're struggling with and that we, that we have to solve. Now, maybe starting with some of the things um, on some of the positive things over the last decades in hydrology, I think one of the things that um, the hydrologic community has done very well is to accept the, the presence and at least the attempts in quantifying uncertainty as part of our, our science, like scientific activity. And before Richard starts throwing things at me, that doesn't mean we do it well necessarily or we get it right, but I think um, the hydrologic community is, is certainly a, a front runner in accepting that we have to consider that we can't measure everything everywhere at the detail that we like, and therefore we have to, to consider that. Um, much of that uncertainty, as we already heard yesterday, is, is epistemic in nature, or maybe it's sometimes called deep uncertainty in the decision-making context, and we can define that as um, uncertainty that is not well determined by historical observations. And there's a, a range of reasons why that might be the case. So the future is not like the past. Certainly, the talks yesterday about future projections of, of climate change is, is 
the biggest case we have to deal with. The fact that historical data is unreliable, certainly when we look at floods, extremes, then we have very unreliable data or, or proxies that we have to deal with, or data is scarce or non-existent, so the example of what Wouter was presenting in developing countries in, in Africa um, is a problem, but I think it's, it's also the data scarcity is also a problem um, if you just go down in scales to what um, Jeff was just showing us. The good thing is that much of that epistemic uncertainty is inherently reducible if we get additional data or if we learn more about the process descriptions that we have to use. So there is an element of learning here that we can, that we can use. So scientifically, I think in, that, in the context of that uncertainty that we just have to accept, what we want is that our, our models are consistent with what we know about the underlying system that we're, we're modeling. And I think there, there are two aspects to this consistency. One is we want to make sure that our models reproduce the behavior that we observe, so that we want them to fit the data. Um, I think we might have a, a little bit of an unhealthy um, obsession with fitting NSE or other metrics, but I think in principle we agree that uh, a model needs to reproduce what we have observed about the system to a reasonable degree. And I think in addition to that, and that links nicely to what Jeff was just showing, we want the model to reproduce um, our perception of the dominant processes in the actual system. Particularly if we want our models to be useful for extrapolation, either in, in, in time or space, then we need to ensure that in situations where we don't have calibration data, that the, the dominant processes are reflected correctly. Um, so we wanted to fit our perception of these dominant processes. Um, one aspect that I think is particularly helpful in this kind of focus on, on dominant processes and in one that I used in my work but I think is something that we haven't carried through certainly to larger scales yet is a focus on minimally parameterized models. So what I mean is not necessarily simple models but models that are adequate or appropriate for the degree of data and information that we have. And I'd like to refer back of some of Howard's work in the 80s and 90s with, with Bruce Beck and I think also with Kevin Bishop, if I understand, uh, if I remember correctly, where the focus was on how identifiable are different kinds of models. How identifiable are there, this was focus on um, water quality models. What is the, for example, the a priori identifiability of a model? What kind of data would I have to have for these models to even be identifiable from the observations um, in, a, in a theoretical way? And then also applied in a practical sense. And I think that's a, um, a particular helpful approach to take that um, has been a little bit forgotten. The way we go about this understanding dominant controls and understanding appropriate levels of model complexity is through global sensitivity analysis. So that's simply a, a set of mathematical tools, algorithms that tell us if I have variations on the input side of my model, so whether these are the model parameters, the forcing data like precipitation or temperature, the design options, if I maybe I include a reservoir, I don't include a reservoir in my, in my catchment, as well as the process description. So do I use green amped or do I use some other process description? And what we're trying to understand with these tools is how does the variability in these characteristics or factors impact the model output, the model response? And that could, for example, be some hydrologic index of service or the, the yield, or it might be um, hazard-related index. Important is here that we can do this with or without actual observations of the output of interest. So we can even, in, in absence of observations, understand whether, for example, using different equations to represent different processes actually makes a difference uh, or matters given that for example, our parameters might be very uncertain. So that's the, the framework that we're using. And it's actually also originating, I thought I'd put this in from some work, my first PhD paper with Sarush and one of uh, Sarush's and Hoshin's PhD student, Doug Boyle. So also not the, still working on the same problem. Um, I think the main, the main difference um, between the work at the time and now is the scale over which we're working and 
the data that we have available. So I, didn't know, I don't know what Howard had to promise the person we got eventually a few data sets from. I think we had eventually 25 or so catchments after a long time of trying to identify data. Um, whereas, whereas now we have data for the whole of the UK. So this is a current project we're working on, on building a UK scale, high logic modeling framework, and you see the amount of data, whether that's topographic or soils data, uh, gauges, and so forth. So we live on some level, we have a, a much more data rich environment, um, often because simply the data is made available uh, that before wasn't. The other issue is that instead of looking at, at a catchment, we're interested in going up in scale because much of the, many of the problems that we have require us to stand, understand the, the hydrology of larger regions. So the, the question I have there is how can we assess the consistency of large domain hydrologic models with respect to their behavior and, and dominant control. So how do we go um, up in scale, continuing from the hill slope to the, to the catchment? Um, the problem is, I think, that for a lot of the experimental headwater catchments that we have, we have highly sophisticated perceptual models, a very good understanding of dominant processes. Um, maybe not if you go down to each hill slope, then that might break down but certainly at the catchment scale. The problem is how do we go from these kind of very well-developed perceptual models to very large domains and still have an idea, an expected perceptual model that works at the large domains. Last year, I've been to a, a Gordon conference and Gordon conferences are a great conference if you can go, lots of discussions. This was on catchment science. And we, we talked in principle about this issue. And one of the nice things that the, uh, the conveners or the workshop organizers did is they, they gave out the clickers to all the participants and invited everybody to answer a whole bunch of questions. Um, so there were questions like, okay, what's your, what's your study domain? And the study domain of people was, as you can tell, largely had water catchment. So there were lots of experimental people uh, lots of former students of, of Jeff were there. Um, some regional, very few global or, um, or large scale. So that was the basis. The, the question that was asked next, or one of the next questions, was if you had $25 million, I don't know what it is here, so I might have to upscale this uh, for this crowd, but uh, um, <laughs> what would you do? What would you do to improve catchment, catchment science? What should we focus on? And the, the result was that, that more than half of the people said, well, we need more cross-site studies. So we need more experimental catchments that we can compare, uh, was, the, was the answer there. And very few, or relatively fewer people said, we need synthesis activities, we need to understand what we actually know already and what's, how far we can go with that. And I think for me, that's a, that's a bit of a, a, a mismatch. Yeah? I, there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't have more cross-site studies, absolutely. I think that's, that's a good thing. But I think that at the same time, because of the tremendous variability that we have in our environment, just looking at the hill slopes that Jeff was showing, um, I think that the, the lack, our, our inability to synthesize the information and to know what we already know and to accumulate that knowledge in a sensible way is, a, is an equally big problem, I think. So I think one thing, one thing we're lacking is a perceptual model of dominant controls across scales from small to large to large domains, uh, which would enable us to bring together that some of the understanding we have. I think in contrast to that being sort of a, a key question that we can, that we can address, I think it, for solving it, it takes um, not one simple solution, but painstakingly bringing together, synthesizing and organizing the knowledge that we have about our environment and what it means, what we can learn from that for high, <coughs> dominant hydrological processes. <clears throat> I think um, Jeff mentioned it already, but the recent paper you had on meta-analysis, 
I think it was a very nice example of that kind of work. Trying to bring together what we know across many studies, I think, is something we don't do well enough. So this is a simple example of some work we did where we looked at groundwater recharge across Europe, and we were simply trying to come up with different perceptual models that we could use to classify different domains and then refine them within the domain with the available data that we have. Um, the reason why I think this is, this is relevant, particular um, for out of calibration applications of the model, it was in, in this paper with uh, former postdoc, Mark, um, Andreas Hartmann from University of Freiburg, where we simply looked at long-term projections of climate change impact for two model configuration, one which is more the, the typical one like PCR Globe, or others use this, with a homogeneous subsurface um, properties and homogeneous recharge compared to a preferential recharge um, which has preferential, preferential flows over, over karstic regions, uh, carbonate rock regions. And um, not to say exactly who's, who's right or who's wrong, but the point is the difference between these choices makes significant difference in the long-term projections of groundwater recharge coming out of these models. So these are essentially not time series, but simply um, running means, 20-year running means of uh, future recharge. And what you see is the difference between heterogeneous and homogeneous representation, which is both different in absolute value as well as in sensitivity to, to the future change trajectory. So in closing, um, I think that one thing that would help us is a stronger focus on the perceptual models that we have of the system, particularly across scales. Um, we put a lot of emphasis on, on numerical models, which is great, but I think that also the perceptual model for me is in the middle between the data and the numerical model. And I think that a lot or insufficient effort is going into that at the moment. Uh, and in closing, this is a, a picture of Bristol. If you're interested, that's uh, Howard's alma mater for his PhD. Thank you very much. I wanted to hear your thoughts on if the challenges that we are facing uh, in terms of modeling across scales. Uh, do you think it's uh, coming from uh, lack of data or is it uh, uh, process representation? And the reason I ask is uh, because if, if we take a step back, I mean, what we are doing is just fluid flow uh, in, in the subsurface low Reynolds number and in the surface maybe a little bit higher. And uh, if we had data, let's say, everywhere, I mean, uh, we, uh, I, mean I don't see why we cannot uh, model even fill and spill processes or uh, even partitioning of the water between uh, uh, vegetation and uh, other, uh, other compartments. Yeah, thanks, Mukesh. Um, I, I think that the, the problem is that we don't have data to the degree that we could reduce all these epistemic uncertainties to a level where it, wouldn't, it doesn't matter anymore. I think that certainly at the moment with our ability to measure or lack of ability to measure and, and the lack of data, as, as Jay was saying in terms of soil depths and other important characteristics that we need, um, I think we need alternatives to um, use the best knowledge that we have. And I think it's difficult to figure out what the best knowledge is at the moment. Um, because I think once it's embedded in a particular model, then it's sort of a, a modified version of your perception because you have to make all sorts of assumptions that uh, make this model different from this model. But I think the, the more important question is not model A or B, but it's what is the perceptual model? What's our understanding of the system and how does that vary across scales and, and, and places? And I think that that is an additional focus we should have. Now, that 
might not be needed anymore if we can model everywhere, but I think, I think it's still, uh, if you like, it, it brings together what we know. I think that's the part. And then you can derive models from that. And the models will have less uncertainty, the better we can characterize that perceptual model with data. You mean instead of, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, okay. I, I think that on a, in terms of a model implementation, the tools we need to, to do this and to look at this, we absolutely need the kind of tools, whether that's Zuma or something that is flexible enough to um, implement um, the uncertainty that we have, for example, in what is the right process description, what is the right level of complexity and so forth going forward. So I think we need the, the right tools to implement that the same as we the sensitivity and also other things. And I think the, the way at least we are about it, go about looking at it is rather than looking at projections is first of all understanding um, what difference does it make, um, what choices I make, what uncertainties I consider, what I don't consider for um, what kind of impact I want to pro project in a particular place. So um, rather than taking a particular scenario forward, we can think of using a, a much wider range of possible, possible futures and essentially try to understand uh, whether any of, the, any of these uncertainties, for example, in the model structure actually matter and where they matter and when they matter and for what kind of, what kind of projections. And I think we, um, so that's, the science to understand what kind of choices do I actually have to worry about and what choices are not so relevant because maybe the forcing uncertainty is so large it doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. I think disentangling that um, is, is for me the first step before we go and focus on the projections is to understand, understand that. And I think we need SUMA or other kind of tool, flexible frameworks in which we can do that. 